In in vitro fertilisation, or IVF, an egg is taken from a woman and is fertilised by a man's sperm in a petri dish. The resulting embryo is then transferred into a woman's womb where it can implant and grow into a baby. When IVF produced its first successful birth, Louise Brown, in 1978, it was controversial and regarded with suspicion as unnatural. Today, IVF has become much more routine and there is far less criticism. The Catholic Church still objects on the grounds that those embryos not implanted are destroyed and that procreation should be a natural act between a man and a woman. Others have raised concerns about older women giving birth to children or lesbian couples making use of the technology to have families without fathers. But if men have long been fathers at an older age, why should we worry about older mothers? There is no evidence either that children brought up in families without fathers are damaged. On these points, both the law and popular opinion are moving in a more liberal direction. A more important concern for those who need IVF treatment is still limited availability due to expense and the limited success rate. While success rates have improved over the years, it remains the case that only around a third of IVF cycles result in pregnancy, although there are prospects that with more research this will improve. More controversial than IVF is pre-implantation diagnosis, or PGD. In this technique, a genetic test is performed on the fertilised embryo before it is implanted into the womb. If the parents suffer from or carry a genetic disease, such as Huntingdon's or cystic fibrosis, PGD allows them to avoid passing it on to their children. PGD has also been used to produce so-called saviour siblings. This is used when there's an existing child with a disease that could be treated if there were a tissue donor available. This was the case for Molly Nash, daughter of Jack and Lisa Nash, who suffered from Fanconi's anemia, a rare blood disease that can be treated by bone marrow transplant. Unfortunately, no donor whose tissue type matched could be found. In August 2000, Jack and Lisa gave birth to a son, Adam. He had been tested by PGD to show that he would be a match for Molly. In the UK, the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority that regulates IVF and PGD argued that testing only for a tissue match should not be allowed. In 2002, they refused permission for the Whitakers to use PGD to ensure that a child would match the tissue type of their son, Charlie, who suffered from diamond black fan anemia. The Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority argument was that the child selected by PGD would not benefit from the procedure. The child would effectively be used by the parents and the sibling. The Whitakers went to Chicago in the US where they used PGD to conceive a son, James. Stem cells from the James's umbilical cord blood were used in a transplant resulting in a total cure for Charlie in 2005. Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority and House of Lords decisions have since shifted in favour of tissue typing. In general, the practical successes of IVF and PGD technology are winning over many critics. Still, worries are expressed that parents making choices about their children could create a society that will discriminate against the disabled or against a gender such as girls. But experience so far shows that parents have the best interests of their children at heart. They will make a variety of decisions. Some deaf parents have even expressed a desire to select for deaf children. Most parents will not make that decision. But when they choose to eliminate, for example, deafness, it is not because they want to discriminate against deaf people, but rather because they want to choose hearing. We should chill out about so-called designer babies and leave the decisions to the parents. I'm Joe Kaplinski on the Chill Out Desk.